Welcome, Pudding People, to another episode of Everybody Loves Pudding. I'm your host, Ken Seymour, with your other host, Richard Geiger. Good evening, other host. Yeah, we, we, we like co-hosts, but other host is much more interesting in mm-hmm. sense of confusing people. Uh, today, we have a fantastic guest, a man of art, a man of inks, a man of superheroes, a comic book artist by the name of Jim Terry. Thank you for joining us. Hey, thanks for having me. Well, for those of you that don't know who this gentleman is, I always like to throw it over to the guest to kind of give a little idea from the horse's mouth of exactly what it is you do and who you are. Oh, okay. Well, I'm Jim Terry. I am a comic book illustrator and writer. And uh, my first project was a crow book, Skinning the Wolves, which James O'Barr provided the story and I did uh, the art and such and uh, I've worked on in the heavy metal uh, Vampirella Alice Cooper versus chaos uh, I had a book with Tim Seeley called sundowners on it's a dark horse and uh, I'm currently working with him on the crow versus hack slash that's kind of exciting I know we were we were lucky enough to meet the illustrious creator of hack slash at the NWI comic-con not too long ago and and uh, to see the two of you working, or uh, you know, have you working on that property is just awesome. I, I enjoy the idea. Yeah, yeah, it, it's uh, we're I'm almost done with the first issue. He's providing, he's writing it and doing pencils, and I'm doing the finishing inks and uh, colors on it. So. For those of you uh, in the audience that may not be completely familiar, I want to give an, an idea because some there's a lot of comic book movies and everything uh, nowadays, and most of them are still mainstream. Uh, Marvel, DC, um, the publishers that that you have done uh, a lot of these titles for are smaller publishers. Um, yeah. So it's uh, some people are going to be familiar with The Crow, and uh, you know it's one of my favorite movies. I know for sure. Uh, as in terms of adaptations, the first one is pretty spectacular, but the it, comics, yeah, it, it hangs. Uh, yeah, it's the, did you, were you kind of a fan of the Crow comics before you got into uh, doing work on that? Actually. Oh, oh, before I started working on it. Yeah. Oh, big time. Yeah. Yeah. As far as the movie, I think I saw the movie before I actually read the book. I remember seeing the col- the covers, the painted covers. And uh, I, I don't know. I just never picked it up. It always intrigued me. But after the movie, I, I, I bought the graphic novel and it kind of blew me away. Yeah, it's, it's as good as the movie is, um, as, as most things go. Whenever you transplant uh, uh, a book or a comic book or a graphic novel, it doesn't always completely make the transition without some substantial changes. Um, oh, yeah, yeah. The emotion. I don't know how they could have could have filmed that. No, that book. No, it's it's yeah. pretty dark. Um, yeah. But uh, but fantastic. So how did you come to start working on that particular uh, installment of the Crow that you did? Well, um, I had been doing my own comics, just you know, with a Xerox machine, going to the FedEx and and shrinking down the pages and stapling them together. I was working on a crime book that I was writing writing and illustrating and doing everything myself, you know, just a garage type comic. And uh, James O'Barr was at a very small convention in a hotel and I showed up there and I had about 12 pages of this thing. And I just threw it on his table and and skittered off. And I, I didn't think anything would come of it. And about four years later, he sent me an email saying he had read it and he liked it. And so he and I started going back and forth and found out that we had many, many interests in common and we became friends. And when he started doing the new Crow books with uh, IDW, he asked if I'd like to try my hand at one. And that was my first professional comics work. And he gave me an incredible amount of freedom. He, you know, he, he watched every page, but he let me do what I wanted. And it was, it was a really incredible experience. 
And so he just he just said, yeah, have fun, just go for it. And that and he gave me the outline of the story and said, make it a make it good. <laughs> well, I I thought Hopefully it was pretty good. No, I I, I loved it. That. that the, one of the nice things about most of the artists that have tackled uh, the crow over the years, it's um, I'm, I'm probably incorrect in my assertion of this, but it kind of has um, almost like a German impressionistic kind of, of take in a lot. A lot of the times the feel of the art in the books, it's um, yeah. It's got a very different, uh, different impression of physical form and how it relates to the space around it, and empty space mm-hmm. and and things like that. And I, I've always enjoyed that. Well, the one that he, the outline that he gave me, took place during World War II, and and a lot of what he and I had in common is a love for the old Harvey Kurtzman EC comics, especially the Frontline Combat and the Two Fisted Tales from the nineteen fifties. And our our mutual love of Jack Davis and Harvey Kurtzman's stories in particular brought brought life to that crow story. So it was uh, it was done in the feel of the old EC books. So our this particular crow was uh, brought back from a camp in World War II, and uh, he unlike most of the other sort of gothically beautiful crows that had come before yeah this guy was gnarly and scary <laughs> and we wanted and we wanted to make this book you know gnarly and scary and uh i think we succeeded we we, we certainly got enough complaints as to the <laughs> over the top gore and such on it well i mean the, if you're if you're looking at idw regardless of whether you're looking at the crow you you kind of got to know what you're getting into to a certain extent, I would think. Yeah, outside of the uh, you know like the the properties, the, the um, you know like transformers and stuff like that, where you can't really go too far. The individual stuff like that, yeah, they they gave us a lot of freedom on that. It's always it's always kind of cool. Um, oh yeah. So I was gonna uh, ask you. You mentioned a little bit about what you had kind of had some history over what you had in common were, were some of the, the older comics. Like what are the things that you kind of grew up on to kind of get your interests going as far as what you're doing now? Well, I think my first comic was uh, John Amita Jr. drawing Spider-Man. And I'm pretty sure it was the Madam Web juggernaut thing that uh, – Oddly enough, is a jump-off point for a lot of people I know that particular storyline. And uh, I've, I've read the superheroes. I was a Marvel guy. I like Batman, but mostly I was a Marvel guy. And uh, I would read those all the way up to you know, I guess around high school. But my mom was a comic book fan as well, and particularly Conan. So she would have nice. Savage Sword of Conan's laying around which I would, of course, you know, look at and I'd, and I'd get all nervous because <laughs> there's a lot of grown-up stuff in those books. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> Barbarians. and so, you know, I got, a, I got a taste for that. And, you know, she took me to, uh, to the worst movies that you could take a kid to. And, of course, that, that formed the, the gentlemanly, you know, sort of scholarly person that I am today. <laughs> Seeing Conan the Barbarian in the theater nice. at six or seven. Yeah. You know, so things like that, you know, just there was there was a superhero in the beginning because, you know, it was it was exciting and fun to read. And, I, and you know, my cousin gave me a whole bunch of amazing Spider-Man. So I got to read a whole entire, you know, 50 issue run. And that was really incredible to you know 12 year old kid but there is also the the horror aspect because not only were there savage sort of conan there was creepy and eerie laying around too so nice that as well yeah did you ever get into any of the old uh tales from the crypt or uh, weird science or anything like that well yeah all the ec stuff i became a voracious collector of all that which is where you know, Obar and I connected with those with those books, especially the war ones that Harvey Kurtzman did. Those are really, in my opinion, the high watermark of, of comics in a lot of ways. Wally Wood, yeah. John Severin, all those guys. Kurtzman was all over the place. He had his fingers in a lot of pies. 
He sure did. He was a heck of a storyteller. Um, you know, people are people have have been influenced him by him without even knowing it. Him and uh, and then I, I went in through a huge Will Eisner period as well, and uh, I discovered him late in the game. But you know, it's never too late. No, uh, you could you could spend the rest of your life, even if you're only 15, looking at the massive amount of contributions through comic books and and keep finding something new you never get through everything there's no way Um, well in the family tree it just the roots go so deep you could just trace it all the way back you know yeah that's that's pretty awesome so how'd you get in you mentioned i i was looking and i i I must miss this but you said you did some work on heavy metal too oh i had a i had a story in there a couple years ago and and there's stuff on the burner now that is uh, down in the pipeline. I don't know if you, it sounds like you had a busy weekend and <laughs> during C2E2, <laughs> Tim had a whole bunch of announcements, including the Crow Hack Slash, and also that he's taken over as uh, managing editor of Heavy Metal. So he and I have been talking about doing some cool stuff. That's fantastic. Now, are you, are you familiar yeah. with Heavy Metal, Richard? Um, is it? No. Well, well, maybe, but <laughs> so heavy metal, at least in the classic sense, uh, is instead of a comic book, really, it's in in a magazine format. So it's it's a larger larger page size, and over the course of the years, it had a a wide variety. Each issue would have multiple stories in multiple styles. Some of them were serial, some of them were self contained, and so you could get anything from you know just kind of ink ink and pencils to full out watercolors to oils uh, realism uh, surrealism just funny usually kind of uh, out there stories great stuff is that where the movie kind of was loosely based on the heavy metal 2000 in, in a manner of speaking the heavy metal movie the animated film from the 80s is based on yeah. stories from the magazine yeah okay so that I am familiar with <laughs> So where, where it, it began as it began as a European publication called Metal Herlant. Oh yeah, I and that's why that. that's why a lot of uh, that's like where that's where I discovered Mobius and Shapiri and guys like that European artists. I, that was the first time I saw them was in that heavy metal. Yeah, it's it's one of the things that kind of stretched my mind when I was younger about considering oh, yeah. what what art was supposed to be in, in, in a kind of a consumer format. It was, it was superior in a lot of, in a lot of respects. So what would you say your artistic style is? If I can, I know I'm asking a hard one here. Yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, I think that it's, it's always evolving as, as it will, but, uh, I'm probably more of a 70s style artist than, uh, than anything else that's you know going on currently especially some of the house styles that are going on i still use a dip brush and uh work traditionally although i've been forced to use uh to use computers to color the book but um other than that this book is going to be completely done with a brush and a pen that's and so that lends itself to a certain a certain different look as opposed to some of the more uh, illustrative stuff going on today. I'm more of a cartoonist. There's well, a reason I don't do superheroes. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I saw on your um, uh, Facebook page, actually a couple of things that we were just mentioning here. So there was a, a post there. You had a, a Conan picture that was on there, and you said it was done in watercolor and ink. Is there yeah. is, is that the, is that your kind of your go-to medium or do you have like a main thing is it watercolors and ink that you do mostly or is it something else well if i'm going to color a piece uh traditionally it's usually in watercolor with uh or marker if i have to do it you know outside of where i usually work i'll bring markers along but yeah generally i like the i like the feel of watercolor but it's tricky to work with with ink Sometimes it bleeds, and I'm not, I'm by no means a maestro of it, you know, but when I'm having fun, that's what I use. 
Where did you train? Uh, did you have some professional training or did you kind of wing it, learn on your own, uh, do what we're doing, falling on our face repeatedly uh, while recording? <laughs> <laughs> well, I still do that, but yeah, I did go to school for a while. I went to a Western Illinois University, which specialized in law enforcement and agriculture, so that's naturally where I went to study art. Makes sense. And uh, <laughs> I like it. That was a joke there. And, um, <laughs> but they did have a really good art art department there, and I learned there the two things, what I think are the only two things an artist needs to know, which is life drawing and learning perspective. Mm. And I always tell people, you know, if you can learn those two things, you can draw just about anything. Explains why I'm a... So I did that there. What's that? Well, I was just going to say, that explains why I'm a bad artist. I've been told that I've lost perspective many, many times. Hmm. <laughs> Yep, yep, well, that'll happen. Sorry. But yeah, aside from just practical, uh, that that was the only schooling I had. And and aside from that, it was just sort of autodidactic, just looking at other people's work and, and studying that, trying to learn from that. Like, I was, using a, I was using a marker. I was using pens and Sharpies to draw my comics until I discovered Will Eisner. And then I, I started using a brush, and it took me, it took me years to get, to get to any sort of de- decent level with a brush, and that was pretty much all I use. Yeah, I can't imagine. Uh, I did a little bit of artistic training, and uh, enough to realize that I was not quite good enough, and I was going to take a great deal of uh, uh, extra training to, to become of a sufficient level to be good enough to be overlooked. But <laughs> the brushes, <laughs> man, I could never quite get to those. Well, do you still draw for fun, though? On occasion. Yeah, well, good. Is I, I feel like, and, and maybe this is coming from a perspective of someone who doesn't hasn't had a lot of that behind the scenes stuff. But from what I see, I, I feel like watercolor maybe is is that like underutilized by a lot of um, publications. Like, am I wrong? But I feel like watercolor seems to be like a lot harder than some of the other mediums to 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 do. Is 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 watercolor Am I just not seeing it, or like what? What am I? Uh, it depends. Uh... Well, traditionally, there's a couple things with watercolor that I've discovered, and one of them is that it's it's difficult. It is difficult to um, reproduce properly. So when you scan it, it, you have to end up correcting all your colors anyways. Once you scan a watercolor, there are tricks that I've been told to get around that a little bit. But for the, you know, if you're just starting out, it's it's difficult. And the other thing is it's just not practical anymore at this point. You know, when you can emulate watercolor with a computer, yeah. you know, what's the point of uh, doing it when you could do it digitally and then correct it in a heartbeat as opposed to re- having to redo an entire thing, you know? Mm-hmm. So computers have eliminated a lot of the, a lot of the practical aspects of, of traditional work just yep. for speed and convenience. Well, do you do you still do those as like maybe commissioned pieces? Maybe. Oh yeah. Well, like I was saying, anything that I do just for fun, or as a traditional piece, if I'm not if it's not going to be printed, if I'm not doing a comic book, a sequential page, I'll color it with watercolor or marker just because I like how it looks, you know, and I like I like the actual process of doing it. But I wouldn't color a comic book that way. It would take forever for me. It would take forever. And then if there were any problems with it, it's a nightmare to have to fix it. Yeah. yeah. Acrylics, maybe. It'll do like a, or, or oil, do like an Alex Ross. Man, some of the stuff that, that he's done over the years kind of blow me away. There's, there's, a, and there's one of him. Yeah. <laughs> You're not kidding on that. So, yeah. oh, you know, that actually brings up a good question, though. So you do your you do your personal uh, works, uh, your commission works, and then you do the stuff for the comics. What's the difference in feel in terms of how you put that together? Is uh, I, I don't think the average person is really going to to kind of know the inner workings. Do, do they just like send you, here's a block of text, here's my storyline, make something. <laughs> what, how's that work? Uh, well, it's different with every writer that I've worked with. You know, um, when I do, when I write my own books, I tend to sketch a thumbnail page out. I, I break it down just in a little loose drawing. 
Then I write all the dialogue on the side. I, you have to figure out the plot loosely beforehand and then work that way. But I've also been given like movie scripts. You know, I have been given prose where I had to break down each individual paragraph. That was a nightmare. And, uh, you know, a lot of times people who write, who are trying to write comics or they want to adapt the comic out of a different idea, they don't understand the complex nature of sequential storytelling because it's an entirely different beast than any other medium. So, you know, if you, if you have, uh, like a lot of the early mistakes that I've seen from young, young writers or inexperienced writers is, you know, having more than one action in one panel. Ah. You know, Johnny, Johnny goes to the, to the room. He looks around, he looks in the cupboard, panel two. Well, <laughs> no, that doesn't work. That's three <laughs> panels right there. <laughs> this is an emotion comic, you know? So, yeah. so there, it's different. And the way that I worked with Tim in the past, because he and I have worked together quite a few times, is he would give me a loose, he would give me a loose page breakdown, and we worked the Marvel style, which was Stan Lee would give a loose synopsis, and then Jack Kirby would go and do the entire book, basically, and then he'd give it to Stan Lee, and he would write he would write words to it. Yeah, occasionally, uh, occasionally I have to censor myself. I had about five or six different jokes about the Marvel style that all wanted to kind of seep out at the exact <laughs> same time as soon as you said that. Marvel, uh, the Marvel well, style. But, uh, try and keep all the talent away from everybody else, and then smear them when they leave. <laughs> it's just kind of there. You go. Yeah. Uh, oh, no, I, that was just kidding. I don't actually think that. It's just uh, you know jokes, right? <laughs> Look yeah. at them now. Well, as far as the writing style, as far as like that, the Marvel style in quotes, it was a very efficient way to get books out quickly, yeah. and it gave the artists a lot of opportunities for for you know creative storytelling. But the the uh, the credit didn't always go where it was due. I don't think. No, well, I think things have gotten better. I'm sure, but uh, did they you sure have, yeah. did you ever? Uh, um, thinking of that that whole marvel style did you ever see that book um how to draw comics the marvel way oh yeah i had it yeah, yeah all the great john basama pages in there yeah, that was that that amazed me and every time i would look at that it's like oh this is how i do it and then i draw it on the next page it's like mine doesn't look like his his <laughs> is so much better yeah. yeah that's a great that's a great superhero storytelling uh, book but I, it's it probably wouldn't apply today no because now everybody they all go for that photorealistic look and uh john busima probably wouldn't be able to get work today so it's kind of <laughs> sad he was he was fantastic yes he was um big john so okay so let's let's um let's kind of go into it since you've had some experience with some comic books um, in the past and you've got uh, the interest that was already there that means you had to have formed some some key um, links to specific characters or stories you said you mentioned or you mentioned that you uh, listened to some Conan or listened to some Conan <laughs> I'm having one of those days hey, that, Conan's got a, it's a great listen that's right and brains fall out the ears funny every single time but uh, so <laughs> <laughs> so you read Conan. Were there any particular characters uh, other than Conan and Spider Man that kind of just was were favorites, or even like now, now that you've been in the industry, is there somebody now that you go, man, I really uh, enjoy this particular character more than anybody else? Well, growing up, uh, the book I looked forward to every month was Daredevil. I love Daredevil, and uh, I would go in and out with Batman, but mostly I preferred to read his his story, you know, the self-contained stories, like the Frank Miller stuff and David Mazzucchelli, that kind of deal. But as far as monthlies, I was there every week with uh, Daredevil and the X-Men. I love the X-Men growing up. I keep getting that. I, I, I got out of comics after, or out of uh, superheroes around college time. Makes that sense. That was right around when, when Image and all those guys started taking over, and then everything became about a million lines. Yeah. Well, I don't know. I wasn't into the hyper detail. You know, I I never have been. I would I, I would always I'm always a little more fascinated with uh, with chunky chunky line work. Yeah. I feel like the the last 
few people we've spoken to have said similar things about X Men um, and Daredevil too. Oh, yeah. Like the, the the same thing. Uh, I, so I always ask the same question as it pertains to the X Men. Did you find that that was a little bit more accessible compared to maybe some of the other comics that were out there? You know, especially in that time frame where there was a, a cartoon that was out like I, I just feel like there was more x-men things available at that time um well in all honesty i started losing interest when i felt oversaturated by it because the uncanny x-men comic book with especially the the john byrne and then the uh and then the john Romita jr years it felt like something incredibly unique and entirely special and it felt like, you know, I was in a secret group of people that knew what the X-Men were. <laughs> I remember seeing graffiti, graffiti in Chicago, and there's X-Men graffiti. And I was like, wow, that nice. person is really cool. You know? <laughs> wow. Well, yeah. And then, and then you know, and then it, it, it became popular and, and it became less special to me, you know. And uh, once once everybody knew that the X, who the X-Men were and the cartoon was on, I... I started fading away from that well you did you didn't want five x-men books each with uh variant covers of <laughs> no no and i preferred wolverine being a man of mystery yeah well yeah. in a way he I still mean, is depending upon how you look at his history i guess so i guess so <laughs> <laughs> i still can't put it together i have no idea yeah yeah i i mean i have friends that work in the superhero industry and they they tell me the stories they're trying to tell, but the things that they can't do because of this and that and this history and that history, and it sounds too Jenga for me. I'm like, wow, oh, wow, I can't keep all that together. <laughs> A timeline on the wall as you're doing your artistic workout. Well, he can't bend at the uh, knee here because an issue of 204. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 17 years ago. That's man. right. So um, we met you at NWI Comic Con. Uh, one of the things that I like to ask uh, our guests is how much of a convention goer are you? I mean, obviously you're there and you're also at C2E2. Do you have a large numbering of different conventions that you go to or are there just a handful that you tend to attend? Uh, I'm kind of a creature of habit. So I go to the same, you know, five or six a year. I don't I don't stretch myself too thin with that. I'm kind of a grumpy guy when I travel too much, so I like to stay home and get my work done and, and go throughout my routine. So, you know, traveling for conventions is a huge expense and, and it's it eats up time and and you know, if you're traveling you like to enjoy things and and you know, when you're in a convention center you they all look the same, you know. For the most part. But I do enjoy traveling and meeting people from different parts of the country. You know, so I go I go to New York usually. I go to uh, usually I go to Seattle for Emerald City. I didn't make it out there this last year, but it's it's fun to meet people uh, from different parts of the country who enjoy comics. You know, and they're and they're all different, but they're they all have something in common. You know, so that aspect I like, but. As far as the practical aspects of traveling and doing all that, it takes its toll on me. And you're you're in you're based out of like the Chicago area, is that correct? Yeah, I'm in Chicago. As as you'll notice, you know, Northwest Indiana. It took me 45 minutes to get to. You know, and I, uh, I know where and you're C2E2 going. And C two E two is like a couple miles away from my home, so those are, those are very pleasant cons for me to go to. Now, are you originally from that area, or did you kind of grow up and move there? Um, grew up in the southwest suburbs and have been in Chicago for the last 25 years or so. so I'm familiar with yeah. the southwest suburbs. Yeah, yeah. I, I think I know which, which question he's about to ask. This this is kind of a this is a common one that we, we go to it's also. The, oh. It's the trend. So, like, everybody we've talked to have been from the same area. So I, I got to at least oh, dive yeah. in. It, it's always a, it's a pizza question, right? So uh, I feel like the Chicago area, that's one of, I mean, amongst many things, is that's what it's known for. So do you have a favorite style or a favorite place that you like to go um, for pizza? 
Well, I could answer that in three parts. Mm. Uh, first one, deep dish pizza. I got to go to Pequod's. Second person that said uh, that? Yeah, it's good stuff. Now, that's like going out for pizza. And then for thin crust pizza, I got to go with John's on Western. Favorite greasy pizza in the city. But if I'm ordering in, I love a Lou Malnati's, you know? So there you go. Mm. All over the place. Best yeah. way to be. No, that, that's good. Yeah. How about well, my wife and I enjoy some Lou Malnati's. That's delicious stuff. Yeah, yeah, it's good stuff. For ordering in. So, <clears throat> pardon me. Looking at some of the stuff online, um, the work that you've done, the Edge Bright and Leo Fuen. Yeah. What's, That's what's my passion project? Yeah, that looked really, really neat, and I, I only got to kind of glimpse it a little bit. What is that? What is that about? Uh, Edge Bright and Leo Fuen was a book that I did. I had just finished doing a uh, my. I had just finished doing my graphic novel the crime book that I had shown Obar those many years ago. And it was six issues long and it took me a number of years to do. And I was so sick and tired of drawing alleyways and seedy hotel rooms that I wanted to draw the polar opposite. And I'm a big fan of fantasy. So I said, okay, monsters, you know, leaves, trees, this sounds good. So I did a, just a, you know, this weird little one issue thing about these this guy fighting his way through a cave full of monsters to, to rescue his, his girl. And then she ends up rescuing him. And I like the characters so much that, uh, I continued their story, but I went back to the day that they met as children and I fell in love with them even more. So that sat on a shelf. I, I printed them and self published them. And it was like three issues and, and then I, I came to a point where, in all honesty, I was I was very depressed, and I went into I went back to these two characters, and I got to show I got to show two people reacting to awful conditions better than I would. You see what I'm saying? Oh, absolutely. So I got to I got to have them face overwhelming odds and do well, which is something that I was trying to do in my own life. And writing these characters helped me through that, through that period. And, uh, I did four issues and I didn't tell anybody and I didn't think about how I was going to publish it or any of that. I still haven't thought about it because I did those four issues and it was a sort of an exorcism. And now I just have to figure out what I'm going to do with it. <laughs> uh, you know. those, those, those were done out of pure love. You know, it was just, I got up, I did a page a day and, and then I did my other work and it was just, now I'm like, Oh, well I should share this with people. And I just got to figure out how to do it. Coffee table book. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I, I haven't even shown it to any publishers yet. Uh. I have a funny yeah. feeling whoever you show it to is going to love it because the it it really has a, a great uh, stylistic look to it as as a lot of your work obviously uh, has shown that that you can do and I I've enjoyed what I saw of it so far I'm uh, oh thank you I, I really can't wait to see uh, can't wait to see some more um, I appreciate that yeah so when you're working one of the other questions that we like to ask. Um, We've talked to several artists over time, and some put on television to just kind of keep them busy. Some people uh, put on music. What do you tend to like to have in your environment? Are you an all quiet, or what do you do to keep yourself running on your projects? I mean, I can work in quiet. When I go to the studio, I'm, I'm in Four Star Studio, and uh, when I go there, it's quiet a lot of times, and I can work in that environment. But when I'm at home, it depends if I'm like, I'm coloring this book right now and I'm working on an eye and the coloring to me doesn't take all my concentration. So I, I put on a movie in the background, but when I'm inking, if I'm inking or penciling or writing, I need music. 
Okay. So, you know, the variety, the spice of life. That's, that's, that's what I'm hoping for. So that music leads us into who are the artists mm -hmm. that you listen to? Are you are you into some of that classic rock and roll, mariachi music, heavy metal, a little rap? What, mm -hmm. do, you, what do you listen to? Oh, I have a rotating... I have a rotating uh, list of music. I'm a big Frank Zappa fan, so I, w I enjoy listening to him when I work because it's complicated music, and uh, but it's also it doesn't take itself too seriously. Uh, I like soundtrack music. I like classical music. I like jazz. I do like rock and roll. I, I'm a big Who fan. Nice. Mm, you know, the, o the only thing I don't really get into is sort of modern country. It, it, there's, it's that, different. That's okay. Yeah. 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 I, I think it's, I, I, I should say, I don't get into anything that is more about um, movement, like dancing. Ah. You know, something, something that is made for people to dance to. I don't get into that too much. I didn't know if maybe you had, uh, talking about soundtracks and, and everything and, until you said not new country. I don't know. I thought, Maybe a star is born as a soundtrack might be playing <laughs> over and over in your studio. Oh, I, I haven't seen that one yet. I hear good things though. It's it's pretty decent if you like uh, what a remake of a remake of a remake. Yeah, a remake. But uh, yeah. series of remakes. Yeah. <laughs> but hey, the the yeah. one previous yeah, Chris I, Christopherson. I saw, right? I saw the newest. I saw Evil Dead in the theaters when it came out. This <sighs> newest remake. So that was a remake of a remake of a remake. So I guess I qualify. <laughs> <laughs> Well, That's true. E Evil Dead. I mean, the the, the original. The, that was that was a classic, though. I mean, uh, and yeah. But Evil Dead Two is basically a remake of Evil Dead. Kind of, yeah. And just adding in some humor that really wasn't in the original. Yeah, yeah. And I enjoyed this newest one. What was it like three, four years old? Something, something like that, yeah. You know, I, I feel yeah. terrible. I actually never saw that version of it. I saw the original three Evil Dead films and uh, the television show, but never took advantage of the chance. I, I had this fear that I was going to be disappointed by the by the newer one. Um, you might you might still be <laughs> <laughs> if you're a purist. If you're a purist, yeah, it's. It's okay, uh, but you you, you got to take it away from the original. I think, right? You got it's 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 a different movie. Different movie. That, yeah. that makes sense. It's a different it's a different movie, but it uh, it it has some some pretty uh, pretty intense moments in it. I enjoyed it. Well, and Raimi knows horror, just as we saw in the Spider Man movie when Tobey Maguire uh, dances uh, <laughs> in yeah. his suit along the it, sidewalk. It terrified us all. <laughs> Extremely scary. Although. You know, I, I've rewatched those recently, and they're still my favorite Spider-Man movies. They're really but, good. Uh, what, what's great about that whole dance sequence is that that is what that is like as evil as Peter Parker gets. <laughs> An evil suit takes him over, and he makes some snide comments, bad relationship yeah. decisions, and he, dances. He, he, his hair gets greasy. He dances <laughs> poorly, and he embarrasses himself <laughs> and the audience. That's. <laughs> That's as corrupt as he gets, which you gotta love. I mean, I I always felt that those were, I, I've, for when they were made, I I thought they were pretty darn good because that wasn't really yeah. comic book movie era. That wasn't a no. focus, so you had to take what you had and hopefully yeah. make it good. And Sam Raimi, I thought was a good choice. Oh, definitely. So and the cast they got was fantastic. That soundtrack to the first Spider Man movie, man, that was so good. Uh, I yeah, still, I still think Spider Man Two is one of the best superhero movies there is. It was ex taking a character like Doc Ock, who is arguably one of the dorkiest, dumbest villains of all time, yeah. and making him somewhat relatable and a threat. That was yeah. a masterstroke, right there. Well, some of those fight scenes were like it. It, it looked like live action versions of John Romita drawings. Yeah, which, they did to me was jaw dropping. And I'll tell you something. I've n I don't know many superhero movies that capture the essence of a character the way it did when Pete, when Spidey stopped that, uh, that subway train, that L train. Mm -hmm. That was pretty fantastic. Cause that is 100% Peter Parker right there. You know, he, 
he's not going to figure out some clever way to do it. He's not going to outmuscle it. He's going to sacrifice himself to save those people. And I, when I saw that, I was like, okay, they get, they get Spidey. Yeah. And I, I, I just didn't feel that way. I mean, I have nothing against the, the people in the amazing Spider-Man films. I, I, I think the biggest problem they suffered from was just having it be released way too soon after the original Spider-Man films. But, uh, Although yeah. the mechanized rhino, I wasn't a <laughs> yeah, particular was, fan of. That was good. But um, uh, I tell you what, Homecoming really impressed me in a lot of ways too. I, I'm, I'm, I, I got one over. I, I really like what they're doing with with that version of Spider Man as well. I'm, I'm excited to see what they're going to do with the sequel. I, I really liked it too. The only problem I have with it is the elimination of Uncle Ben. Yeah. Not that I wanted to see him die again. I don't no. need to see that again. <laughs> no. But, but uh, to me, Spidey is all about guilt. Like he's driven by his guilt. Yeah. And everything he does is based on that. And to not have that being being an aspect of his character just really kind of it was missing for me when I watched that. Maybe they'll hit that with like a little flashback in the sequel or something. Just uh, just a memory sequence. Yeah. Maybe. We can hope. Although, uh, speaking of also Spider-Man films, if you have not seen this yet, one of the one of the true joys over the last year, uh, that Into the Spider-Verse, very impressive. Oh, that was fantastic. Yeah. As a matter of fact, I went to buy it at Best Buy yesterday and it was sold out. <laughs> of course it was. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I get for shopping at stores. Well, no, you should always... Uh, well, <laughs> small stores. Visit your local small stores and keep those people in business. The, exactly. Yeah. But uh, so, I still enjoy purchasing hard copies of movies like that. But I feel like lately, it's almost, gosh, it's almost not worth it to an extent. I stream almost all the movies. Even I buy them and I download the digital copy, and then I just end yeah. up streaming them. And I've gotten burned on it here lately, where I go buy the combo and you just I, I look on whatever streaming service it is and I can buy it and it's like five bucks cheaper and it has all the things it's in 4k <laughs> and it's like oh my gosh it's why am money. I doing this yeah yeah well you're talking to the wrong guy I'm a I'm a physical media guy well if I, I, I honestly I, if CDs I were myself. still a thing like you could readily buy CDs I'd buy the CDs oh, yeah. like that, that's I, I I I'm in that same boat I, I've yeah. just been burned lately on a couple movies I've bought. So. Yeah, no, I, I get that too. Five <laughs> bucks, and then, you know, a month later, it's $9. Uh-huh. Like, ah, I should have waited, but I don't have any patience. Well, you know, they're, they're counting on that. You know, that brings an interesting question. So... You tend to work in non-superhero kind of books. And there's been several yeah. non-superhero translations into television and film uh, over the years. What is one that has not been translated that you would like to see moved over into uh, that sort of a format? You mean what, what comic have I read that I think should be a movie? Indeed. Yeah. Um... Man, I like them as comics. <laughs> <laughs> Come up with some new movie ideas. Good, yeah. good answer. Good answer. We we don't need more translations. That makes sense. Uh, uh, I mean, if I if I could if I could redo the Spirit movie, I would say that. Yeah, I uh, I love the Spirit. I love the Spirit, and that that movie broke my heart in half. Well, what what that uh, Gabriel mocked? Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. That, I the, thought he was fine. He was I good. thought he was fine. It just didn't feel like an Eisner story. No. It's it's hard to replicate that kind of feeling. I mean, it's 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 really an elusive little uh, little thing. You either get it or you don't. Maybe that's why yeah. uh, Miller took such drastic uh, steps to kind of take step-by-step <laughs> control of Sin City and things like that. Yeah, yeah, probably. Uh, I'd oh, yeah, to, I would love to see a good spirit movie. That would be pretty cool. There's been a couple. Um, uh, yes, I'd like to see a good one, though. <laughs> <laughs> you, yes, you and me both, uh, I, I think. 
Um, Spirit Stallion of the Cimarron? No, no, <laughs> not that one. Uh, but uh, we got a lot of good stuff, though. I mean, you know, talking about uh, whether it's original or whether it's derivation, I don't know if you can see it. I don't know if you are tuned in at the time, but uh, I'm wearing my Cobra Kai shirt right now because I'm super excited about the second season of, uh, of oh. that. Yeah, I haven't, I haven't caught any of that. I mean, I saw Karate Kid in the theater. You know, that's how old I am. But uh, yeah, I, don't, I don't have any long-lasting affection for it. Yeah. It's fun. It, it, well, I mean, and that's fair. The original movies were fun, but they weren't, uh, for a lot of people, something that really dug down. But this, this Cobra Kai show really takes yeah. a, a different direction and is done extraordinarily well. And I, that's I, what I hear. I've been very impressed. I would love to take get a chance to talk with some of the uh, some of the creators of that show and maybe uh, pick their brain and see see what it was that really. They were at C two E two. All those fellas. I I saw, uh, and uh, they are seeing that was partially responsible for me losing a layer of enamel on my teeth as I <laughs> gritted several <laughs> times. Like I I need to talk to them now. Uh, yeah. Get them on the show, man. Yeah, uh, there we go. We're going to work on it. We're, we're, we're making slow steps ever so uh, trying to uh, get more and more people, uh, different uh, viewpoints. I mean, like I, I don't see too many. And this is a thing that one of the reasons I wanted to talk to you. How, how often do you actually get to hear a, an artist kind of tell you a little bit about what it is that they do? I mean, you can occasionally read some articles here and there, but I don't, I don't see too many interviews. Um. Well, I think that I think that uh, it's it's like so many things. I mean, uh, there's more access to artists, but also not always the ones you want to hear from. You know, most of the guys I wish I could. There's books written on my heroes, you know, so yeah. I I have to read them, and I'm not. I wish I was a little more aware of everything that's going on now, but. I got my head buried in the past most of the time. So I I read a lot about Frank Frazetta and, you know, Will Elder and all those guys. But uh, I need to listen to some more podcasts uh, with interviews with modern artists because uh, it's what I do. I should be listening to that. Well, we love we love talking to artists and authors. And I know we had two separate podcasts where we talked to Larry Elmore, and he's a fantastic gentleman and, and – uh, just a, an amazing artist if you like fantasy art but uh, mm. are, are you familiar with his work at all i will be <laughs> <laughs> that classic <laughs> look at classic dungeons and dragons stuff and that's okay. that's kind of uh where he resided and his his work is pretty amazing really yeah he uh Excellent. he kind of not grew up on but like one of his first things was drawing manuals for the army Okay. I mean, it sounds sounds crazy to think that, but that's where he kind of got his first professional. Was it for, uh, uh, what was it called? Because uh, that's actually something that Will Eisner helped spearhead during World War II. Training manuals. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, yep. the training manuals. And yep. he started doing them as comic books. Yep. So they found it was easier for for the common common person to retain information visually. That's why we're going on Twitch now because I don't know if our voices are really <laughs> doing it. We're we're hoping that people. <laughs> hey, you're, you know you're 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 forwarding, you're thrusting forward into the modern age. Yeah, one baby step at a time. Yes, small thrusts yeah. here and there. So this new project before we run out of time because I really want to talk go yeah. into this a little bit more. So Hackslash has a, a kind of an existing world and history, and what what are what are you kind of can you tell us anything about this new new step this new story? Ooh, um, well, you, if you know anything about Hackslash, you know that it's uh, Cassie Hack is sort of the quintessential last girl, the survivor of, uh, you know, serial killers, whenever, and especially in horror films, there's usually a survivor and it's usually a woman and they're called the final girl. And, uh, she is one. And, but now what she does is she's turned around and she says, okay, well, I'm going to hunt down 
whatever I could find. If there, if it's a supernatural killer, I'm going to find it and I'm going to take it out of the game. So if you know anything about her and you know about the crow, you know, somebody who is brought back <laughs> rather supernaturally a little bit. to dispatch a, its own form of justice, you know, they might clash. <laughs> that's what happens in this book. Uh, I cannot wait to see that. See, now the only thing that's left because uh, you know there was there was a great bit um, that where uh, Army of Darkness and uh, Freddy and Jason kind of had that comic interaction. So you need that yeah. third party when you're done with this. See if you can uh, also fold in like uh, Buffy the Vampire Slayer <laughs> or Frey, oh. something like that. Yeah, it shows up at the end. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we'll see. I, I I can't wrap my head around all those uh, trademarks. But somebody <laughs> might be able to. Yeah. Well, I I just want to say how much I appreciate you coming in to to talk with us for a while here. And that was uh, my pleasure. And it's and it's great to hear from you. And and hopefully we'll get a chance to talk again. I have a funny feeling that we are going to see you at conventions here and there. Uh, Please <laughs> say go. hi. Please stop by and say hello. We will definitely do so. Absolutely. Thank you again, man. Oh, it was my pleasure, man. And thanks for your uh, thanks for getting back in touch with me and get me getting me on here and out of my little hidey hole. Uh, we, we appreciate it. All right.